A continuación vamos a tener una entrevista con el señor Ken Yang, uno de los arquitectos más famosos del mundo. Él dice ser ecologista ante todo, antes de ser arquitecto. El señor Ken Yang ha sido nombrado eh, por la prensa británica Guardian como una de las 50 personas capaces de salvar al mundo. Y hoy tenemos la dicha de tenerlo en la República Dominicana con nosotros. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Ken Yang, to our country, to the Dominican Republic. You did yesterday a beautiful conference. What is the message you would like to transmit to future generations? I think if we don't do something about the future now, we may not have a future ahead of us. So the simple message is that, yes, we have to do something about it now. Um, but uh, the technology and the um, technique and theory of green design is, for me, is still in its infancy. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, there's not enough people doing it. And there is also a lot of uh, misunderstanding about it. You know, a lot of people think that if you, you know, if you have, let's say, photovoltaics or you have, you know, you have a few things here and there, recycled materials is green, that's but okay. uh, then you're okay, or that, that's green, but that's a lot more to it than just that. And so that is the bit that bothers me a bit, that um, there's so much misunderstanding. Because the misunderstanding, it, uh, it lets people think that, you know, just by doing a little bit is enough, but it's not enough. So you, know, you have to do a lot more than just, just. How did you begin to think about uh, eco design? Because you say you were in a college first and then an architect. When was the, the, the decisive moment where you decided, okay, uh, I need to fix it. I need to do my part. Oh, well, this was this goes back a few a few years. Um, I had just about finished doing my. A final year exams, you know, as an architect, you know, at the Architecture Association in London, and then one night at the at the bar, I met um, this gentleman who was a senior lecturer at Cambridge University. So he asked me, you know, we got talking. And then he said he started, he's just about to start a unit that is working on the project called the Autonomous House. The Autonomous House is a project that was mooted by Buckminster Fuller. The idea was for a house which is uh, independent of the utilities of the city. That means it has its own independent water, independent energy, independent food, independent everything else. And so uh, that's why I call it autonomous. Autonomous means, you know, by itself. Sure. After a few months in the project, I realized that the whole project, as they were doing it, is just about engineering. I said, but what about the environment? You have to look at the bigger picture. So I said to my supervisor, you know, my my uh, my boss, I said, look, I really would like to work on the theory of green design and, and planning. And so he said, that's fine. So he released me from employment, and I became a research student to write a PhD on the subject. So in writing the subject, you know, working on it, I had to study ecology. I had to study. Um, a little bit about engineering, a little bit about this, a little bit about, about ma ecological master planning. And so uh, three years later, I finished writing my PhD. And then, I, you, know, you know, when you finish a PhD, you're not sure what to do. But in any case, the, the, the theory and the work that I've done um, became the agenda for the rest of my life. And so, you know, I was, I was just trapped into it. You know, I couldn't do anything else. But it is a beautiful thing to be trapped into in such a huge project. I won't ask you what is your next project because your life will be spent looking for new ways of implementing and giving green eras where the, the, the concrete is uh, predominating now, uh, where the steel is still predominating. Um, if you had a dream, what would it be? If you, if you now can say, okay, I, I want this dream to be fulfilled, what would it be? Oh, dream. We Yeah, Swinia. <laughs> I dream I don't have to work. <laughs> this would be really your dream? Well, uh, I'm working so hard now, you can't believe it. Um, I've been an architect for nearly 40 years now. And uh, I work just about day and night. And right now I'm very busy and I'm, I'm, 
I'm the busiest than I've ever been for 40 years. I'm doing all the projects I want to do for 40 years. And so I know I'm, when you reach my age, you're running out of time, so uh, you just want to do as much as you can. So my dream is to, at, at, at the end of the day, to find the, to find the, to find the magic solution that will help humanity, you know? Um, I don't know what it is. I mean, if we could do something that's very simple, that could help humanity for the rest of, could help humanity, then you've done something really useful. I'm just like, you know, Edison invented the light bulb. Now, the light bulb is just a very simple thing, but it just, you know, just helped, you know, give us light for the evening. So if I could find the equivalent, if I discover something equivalent to the, uh, to the light bulb, architecturally or ecologically or in comes ego design, then that is my dream, if I can able to do that, you know. But I think you've done, you're great because uh, you recognize now you have, uh, I think, more projects than you can even handle. Your eco design and your aesthetically proven design, where you give more areas to green, Uh, where you give more areas to nature is is accepted now and is uh, followed by so many people. So, in that sense, I think your your uh, footprint in the in the history of architecture is is already well settled. But tell me, what is your biggest challenge every time that you work on projects? Um, well, the biggest challenge is trying to, as you say, persuade a client to do what you want them to do. And it's not easy. And nine times out of ten, you know, you, uh, they say no. So you have to find some way to convince them, assign, find some substitute anyway to, to what you're trying to do. And so that is the biggest challenge. You know, as I mentioned, um, the life as an architect is not easy because it's very cash flow driven. And you have to work very hard. You have to do work first before you get paid. And so, th you know, trying to balance the uh, You know, trying to balance the cash flow is, is um, you know, is is the one of those um, stressful aspect, aspects of being an architect. No, of course you can delegate to somebody else, and somebody else looks after finances. But at the end of the day, um, people depend on you. You know, you have to sort of you know, do a lot of the chasing yourself. So, um, in many ways, um, yes. Uh, you think I've done something important, but you know, you never really see your own work that way. You never go back and say, oh, I've done something important, I've done something very important, no, and you know, so you, you, th you think, well, these are things that I have to do. As soon as you solve a couple, they have new ones that come up, and so it seems, you know, to be going on forever. If you look into the world of architecture, not everybody like what we do, because a lot of people, I think, a little bit, a little bit frightened, you know? Because they don't understand what we're trying to do, and they, they uh, because they don't understand and know enough, they can't do it themselves. Then the opposite reaction is to is to be aggressive. And I mean, it's not like you know everybody loves what we do, but there's been a lot of antagonism to what we do as well. So having to live with that is, is, is uh, you know can be very tiring. I guess it, you've been traveling three days to come to our fair, to do such a long trip to visit Dominican Republic. In, in this country where so much dynamism is going on, where a lot of construction is going on, what is uh, the message you would give to, to, to the country? I, I wish you could stay more. Maybe next time we'll try to, to organize something that really all participants in the country, whether it's a government, whether it's uh, institutions, do uh, participate at the fair and do hear the the beautiful message, because it is a message. It is a message of faith, it is a message of uh, future projects, it is a message of work and what is still to be done. Yesterday with so many young uh, people, young architects, and the youth was there, and this is... What would you give to a uh, message to Dominican Republic in itself? Because it's a beautiful country, beautiful scenery, but I think so much still is still to be done. Well, you know, this part of the world has just about the highest biodiversity than anywhere else in the world, you know, except for maybe Costa Rica is very high because Costa Rica is where the two continents meet. And so with this level of biodiversity, you have to preserve it, you have to take care of it. 
And so this is what, if I were to have a single message, it would be just, you know, map the biodiversity of your country, know the different species that are here, um, and look after it and, and to treasure it. Because we tend to ignore other species as human beings because we think they were the greatest of all species, you know. We're the only species, you know, that matter. But that's not true because the other species have a role. You know, when you start losing species, the whole ecosystem becomes increasingly simplified. This is the this is a wonderful country. You should take care and protect it. And the road is is long, let's say, and uh, maybe uh, it will take several generations. However, I'll wait several generations. We have to do it now. Actually, this is interesting. Why do you say that? Mm -hmm. Why you say we can't waste generations? Because we are running out of time. You know, uh, even though um, people think they have a lot of oil and the Americans have just been able to produce a lot more oil from shale oil, in which maybe 10 years ago they, they, they still couldn't, you know, could be done. Sure. But um, very soon we run out of oil. You know, we've gone past the halfway point already. And so when you run out of oil, then our lifestyles have to change because oil runs everything in our lives, and not just our now, you know, our transportation, you know, our electrical systems, your your credit Plastic, card, yeah, your sure. credit card, your internet, everything. So when that happens, and we run out of oil, then we will have to we have to change our lifestyles. Um, in fact, we should start changing now. But a lot of people don't understand this. They say, "Why do you have to change now? Because you know everything's fine. You know everything's okay, and and that." Um, Tomorrow the sun still rises and I switch, switch on the lights as it still goes on. But there will be a point in time, in maybe 30, 40 years' time, within the, our generation anyway, that uh, this will happen. And so we don't have several generations. We have to do something about it now. But, you know, t as an optimist, people could say, well, you know, near the time the scientists uh, will invent something. They will get us you know, out of it. For instance, um, the only source of energy is renewable. It's from the sun. And so, and what happens is that the energy is produced through photosynthesis. So now, at the moment, the only way you can get energy from the sun is through photovoltaics, which is using silicon, and it is a very, um, you know, a very efficient process. Only about, maximum now is about 15, 18% efficient. So uh, hopefully between now and the next you know, 10, Yes, or so people will discover how to make photosynthesis, artificial photosynthesis, for example, you know. If they're able to, to invent artificial photosynthesis, then we have boundless energy, enough energy to keep us going. But that's not the only thing. If we, you know, even though we have enough energy, we have to be careful how we use materials. I mean, at the moment, it's what we call a, th uh, a throughput system. Mm -hmm. We take materials from the, from the earth, we use it, then throw it somewhere, you know, oh, it's, th it's throughput. Yeah. Throughput, okay, if that, um, but, but there's no way. So waste is a human uh, invention. In nature, there's no waste. Everything in nature is recycled. And so we have to start to close the loop, close the cycle, not just in materials, but also in water and, and everything else we do. And then we need to increase the connectivity in, in the landscape because what we do now is that we chop up the landscape. We go on a piece of land, you know, human beings come in, we chop it up, we fragment it. Fragment means, you know, what seems, what's the total holistic landscape where everything's connected. We segment, we cut it off, we, we segregate it. And so once you do this, the little pieces, the patches of vegetation that used to be interconnected, which used to be interdependent, is now um, reduced and, and it is, um, the viability is affected. Your project is interesting because actually you reconnect and you do like bridges of uh, to, to connect one segment of the other with green sceneries. So I think that the uh, birds and uh, the animals in general come back, right, to the to the city. But tell me more about the water system, because this is interesting and this is really uh, applicable here. This country is where it rains. One is the countries where it uh, rains more in the world. So there is really something we could do about it. Explain me how you design the, 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 um, the buildings so that the water doesn't waste? Well, water is what life is about, you, you know. Um, you know, when, when astronomers look into the uh, other planets, the first thing to try and look for is signs of water. Because where there is water, 
there is organism, there is life. Mm -hmm. And so everything depends on, on water. Now, for instance, let's say, you know, in your home, you know, if you run out of electricity, it's fine. You know, you can still live without it. Sure. Maybe you have, you know, you have, a, have a, you know, candles and things like that. But you run out of water, it's, imp it's, it's, it's incredible. You can go crazy, you know, without water. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is to, a number of things, we have to close the water cycle in every location. That means, you know, you just can't just use the water and let it go down the, the pipes and into the drains. Once it goes into the drains, it goes from the drains into rivers, and the rivers into the sea, then it's gone forever. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure the water that falls on the land stays back on the land. Mm -hmm. So we need to close the loop, need to, need to harvest it and to maintain it. And, and so um, that is the real problem, that is the challenge, to, to recycle and reuse grey water. Then, in addition to our human society, we have black water, which is a sewage. So now what happens is that we treat the grey water, the black water, mechanically, yes. and or, the, or we you know, discharge it somewhere into the sea and the rivers. But what we need to do is to try and treat the mechanical, the, uh, the black water within the site, within the, mm -hmm. so that in the water is treated progressively through a series of filtration ponds before it gets back into the ground. So water is like a, like a resource that we have to take care of. And now, if you look into the globally, then you realize that uh, recycling water and closing water cycle isn't possible everywhere in the world. Now, for instance, let's say in the uh, desert countries, it's impossible to close the water cycle because, first of all, it's so hot you have evaporation. So, so the water is always increasing less and less and less. And then if you look into the uh, Arab countries, where does the water come from? The water comes from desalination. Right. So and that means you take... It uses a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. so, you know, people talk about building eco cities in, in the Middle East. And I said, how can a city be eco e ecological, or how can it eco when the water itself is unsustainable? You have to get it from the sea. You have to use energy to desalinate it, and then having used it, you know, by t you can't even close the cycle because. It's diseases that will kill us before, but there is a word definitely is not land, but uh, land and water. Um, Mr. Yang, it was beautiful having you here. It's a huge honor in, for the yeah. country in general and for myself. And to know somebody that has done so much for, for the matter, for ecological and for architecture in general, your buildings are beautiful, said it. And the message is, is strong and clear. And I think that... Um, we will rediffuse it and we will um, put it that the young generation sees it and understands and maybe maybe we can also convince my generations and older generations to be part of the change so thank you very much for being with us in Dominican Republic and next time I hope we will be able to take you to see the biodiversity because there is so many nice places to visit so thank you very much Dr. Yang thank you, <laughs> thank thank you. you.